um, three things. Um, you'll see the uh, PowerPoint that we're using today. Please, um, if you wish to have a copy of that, um, that would be how you would um, pull the uh, PowerPoint um, as your handout materials. You'll also see a copy of the statute that was um, passed that we're going to be covering today. And finally, you're going to be seeing the attorney affirmation form. If you want to have CLE for today's program, you're going to need to complete the attorney affirmation form and forward that to Empire Justice Center. The other piece of information is we have approximately um, 100 people registered for today's webinar. We have about half of them on the line right now. Um, and we may be having people join us throughout. It's important to know that we will not be unmuting the lines. Uh, we will be taking any questions through the chat feature. Um, so you'll see um, on the right side of your screen, you'll see um, a box. Right now it says, um, welcome. The webinar will begin shortly. That is where you can type any questions. Um, and presentation today. Briefly introduce the uh, presenters along with myself, Amy Schwartz. I'm a senior staff attorney at Empire Justice Center. Um, we are also joined by Margaret Perkins, who is the supervising attorney in the Rochester Office of Legal Assistance of Margaret's Practice on Housing Law and Homelessness Prevention. Um, we're also joined by Nadja Rosen, who is the Deputy Director in the Housing Unit of South Brooklyn Legal Services, where she supervises attorneys and paralegals representing tenants in eviction proceedings. Um, Ms. Rosen was previously a supervisor in the Family Law and Domestic Violence Unit at South Brooklyn. Um, and so uh, both of our presenters come to us with incredible rich knowledge, both about housing law as well as about uh, domestic violence issues. So with that, we're going to begin our program. OK. All right, so um, uh, I'll just be, uh, again, really quickly. Um, the, the, the laws that we're going to be talking about today are um, new anti-discrimination laws and anti-eviction protections that were passed in New York. Um, for some of you that have been doing this work for a while, you've probably um, been aware that New York is um, unlike um, a number of states that have statewide uh, anti-discrimination and anti-eviction protections and the advocate community has long been lobbying for those and in fact um, in 2010 a law uh, that was sort of similar to this actually did pass um, but was subsequently vetoed um, because Governor Patterson who was our uh, governor at the time believed that the law was written um, a bit too broadly um, would encompass too many potential um, crimes, um, too many potential acts um, that would be brought the um, anti-eviction protections into the purview uh, and the anti-discrimination protections into the purview of the New York State Division of Human Rights. Um, Unlike this law, um, which puts it squarely in the hands of the domestic violence survivor um, to enforce um, through a private right of action, um, that I believe that the governor was very concerned at the time of adding to the burden, I guess, so to speak, of the New York State Division of Human Rights. Um, the law was ultimately passed as part of the Women's Equality Agenda, or WIA, um, as it uh, was its so-called name. Um, and it was a package of laws um, addressing a variety of things. And you'll see as we go through this law that there's some things that are non-domestic violence related um, that were included in this law, um, which we will not be discussing with any length other than to just point it out to you. Uh, the law was actually signed uh, last year on, December, on October 21st. And you see the citation in the materials. Um, but like many laws, uh, it was made effective approximately 90 days after it was signed. And so um, just about um, a month ago, the law actually went into effect. And it does a few things, um, but it makes some real enhancements to the real property law as well as to the RPAPL. Uh, and you'll see here that the protections are contained in the housing laws, even though uh, at least the anti-discrimination protection um, is not, uh, it's contained in the real property law, it is, but it is not given um, to the New York State Division of Human Rights, even though it is an anti-discrimination protection. And so um, the state courts are the courts that will be hearing um, any enforcement actions. Okay, so I'm going to be turning on to my um, next presenter. 
So this is Nadja, um, and I just wanted to start off by reminding folks that while we are using the language of the statute, which talks about DV victim, for those of us who have worked in the anti-violence community for, I can speak for myself, for almost 20 years, um, I use the language domestic violence survivor. So I just want to be clear, um, and I think it may be necessary for some courts to have to use the words victim, but that we should also remember that we want to educate our judges and maybe use victim slash survivor or survivor when we're talking. So um, this law talks about discrimination based on domestic violence status being prohibited. And so very clearly it says that no person, firm or corporation, or their agent who own or manage a building for dwelling purposes may discriminate based on a person or family member's domestic violence status. So they may not refuse to rent to any person or family, or discriminate in the terms, conditions, or privileges of the rental, or to print or circulate any statement or publication which directly or indirectly expresses any limitation or discrimination based on domestic violence status. Next slide. Now, when we look at what is the definition of a domestic violence victim, um, it really tracks two statutes. So first of all, it says that the DV victim is a person or the accompanying parent of a minor child who is or has been the victim of an act that constitutes a family offense either pursuant to the Family Court Act, Section 812.1, or a violent felony offense pursuant to the Penal Law 70.02. And that the act alleged to have been committed had to have been made by a member of that person's same family or household, also pursuant to the Family Court Act. Next slide. So the family offenses are enumerated in the Family Court Act, and they also are actually found in the penal law. They include assault in the second and third, or attempted assault, stalking from the first to the fourth, harassment in the first and second, et cetera, and they're all listed here. The violent felony offenses pursuant to Penal Law 70.02 are <laughs> humongous, and they are all, they're B, C, D, and E felonies, and they include such things as arson, robbery, attempted murder or manslaughter. Next slide. So important in this analysis is figuring out whether or not the survivor had some uh, these acts committed against them by a family or household member. So the family or household member, again we're getting into family court stuff, means there are people that are related by blood or marriage, people that are legally married to one another, formerly married to one another, they have a person, they're people who have a child in common, regardless of whether they have been married or have lived together, or people in a current or former intimate relationship. And this may be an area in which um, the housing court is going to have to do a little jurisdictional inquiry. And there are uh, there is some case law now around intimate partner, intimate relationships that may in fact come into housing court, I don't know. Next slide. Are you able to see the slide change? Yes. OK. This is Margaret. Oh. I'm handing it over to Margaret. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the consequences of the discrimination is it is a, a, the violation is a misdemeanor, which could be punishable by a fine of not less than $1,000 and up to $2,000 for each offense. Um, and the defense to the misdemeanor is that there is another lawful ground that the landlord refused to rent the unit. Now, just as in addition to the criminal penalty 227D uh, provides, uh, it also allows the victim of the discrimination to file a civil suit. So um, here, the, um, she or he could sue for compensatory damages, punitive damages, declaratory and injunctive relief, and attorney's fees. And um, the civil suit could be brought in any court of appropriate jurisdiction. Now, um, when we think about jurisdiction, of course, we know that the Supreme Court will always have jurisdiction uh, because it is a court of general jurisdiction. Uh, 
Whether or not you could bring it in a city court or a county court, at least in upstate, is um, might take some research. Um, we know that city court has a jurisdictional limit here of 15,000, but um, and um, there are some restrictions though on injunctive relief. Uh, we and county court has a, uh, I think, a threshold of $25,000 cap for um, for damages, but County courts, um, I think, administratively, some of them uh, parse out what types of civil cases they'll take. So you will have to do some looking into that for your own jurisdiction. And I think we had discussed, uh, Margaret and I had talked about this as well, and that downstate, I think, I mean, I would always prefer to go to Supreme Court in a case like this, and I would hope that that would be where we would we would be seeing these cases. Yes. Um, then in talking about um, when you think about compensatory damages, generally they're going to cover things like out-of-pocket costs. And uh, moving expenses could be storage, the increased costs associated with uh, having to rent a different apartment, as well as emotional distress. Uh, emotional stress generally falls under the umbrella of compensatory damages. And um, although there's no limit on compensatory damages, this statute does put a cap on punitive damages. Uh, they can't not exceed $2,000 for each offense. So this obviously is quite low. Now I want to talk about attorney fees. This is one of the bright lights of this legislation um, because it allows um, attorney fees can be awarded to the victim. Um, if the victim or he or she prevail, is the prevailing party. Um, obviously, the court's going to have to determine uh, what uh, attorney fees are reasonable. Um, but access to attorney fees is really important uh, because it's more likely uh, victims of this discrimination are going to get representation from counsel uh, when they want to assert their rights. And get relief under this uh, statute. And in terms of the defendant, uh, the landlord, in cases where the defendant prevails, um, the landlord could make a motion to recover reasonable attorney fees uh, from the plaintiff victim, but only upon a showing that the civil action was frivolous. And the statute does define what frivolous is. Um, for example, the action was commenced in bad faith uh, solely to delay or prolong um, the litigation. Uh, or the action was continued in bad faith without any reasonable basis um, and without a good faith argument uh, for the reversal of the existing law. But bad faith here does not include where an action or proceeding was promptly discontinued when the party or the attorney learned or should have learned that the action or proceeding and um, housing providers are subject to a reasonable standard if they're going to deny housing. So the statute is not intended to limit the ability of the providers from applying reasonable standards to deny housing. However, in all cases, the denial can't be based or derived from domestic violence status. OK, and there's some of the properties we, that are not subject to the anti-discrimination protections are owner-occupied dwellings that have two or fewer residential units. Um, so you just want to be sure if, if the unit um, in question is not owner-occupied, uh, then they are subject to the law. Um, then this is a provision I think that is, I think could be helpful for um, our clients. It, it says that the housing provider will not be civilly liable to other tenants, guests, licensees, or invitees arising from a reasonable and good faith effort to comply with the law. 
um, as many of you may see in court, when you're, you know, even if it's not a DV situation, you have landlords saying, well, listen, I have to evict based on this conduct because I'm worried about civil liability for my other tenants. in fact, settling or working out something that really is uh, what's best for your client. But this at least gives some um, protection in cases like that. So, so, you're next. Yeah, this is me. Yeah. And I should make it clear, we are in different, two different spots, which is why we have to say over the, over the webinar that we are switching. Um, so what the, do, the law does not bar. It, the law very much makes clear that landlords are still able to create a rental preference for domestic violence survivors. So um, supportive housing for domestic violence survivors is still allowed to be maintained and flourish, hopefully. To, so landlords um, are also able to continue to provide assistance to domestic violence survivors in obtaining and retaining rental housing. And this one I think is a little strange, but they are also able to respond to an inquiry or request by a survivor. I don't know why they would, we would ever have to tell people that, but I guess that was necessary in some way. Uh, Joe, does, yes. So this is Amy. I just, maybe I can um, flesh that out a little bit. Great. One of the concerns um, that um, housing advocates had expressed um, when we were looking at some of the languages of the previous um, iterations of this kind of law was um, there was a concern that, um, I don't know if the word is discriminating on the f four um, ways to assist domestic violence victims, um, domestic violence survivors, um, was uh, would be barred where landlords were, for example, like asking survivors um, information that would allow them to maybe give them a preference or to provide mm. them certain supportive services. And so I, I think... See. They wanted to make really clear that um, that this law would not dissuade people from that practice. So that if you wanted to really use, um, to, if you wanted to assist domestic violence survivors and their families, this law wouldn't serve as a bar for that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to remember to remind both the landlord and the court what they can continue to do, um, which is I think it's why it's great that this is in here. I also think. Um, you know, similar to, for those of you who are um, DV advocates, survivor advocates, um, you know, there was a law that was passed a few years ago in the Family Court Act making it very, very clear that survivors cannot violate an order of protection by merely contacting their abuser. I think such similar, um, very clear language was necessary to ensure that survivors were, in fact, able to continue to act, continuing to access services, so I'm glad that's in there. Um, the other thing that this law does not address is that it does not provide for an ability to bifurcate, or bifurcate joint tenancies with the abuser. That is not what this law is for. Let's be clear about that. And Nadja, could um, you explain what a bifurcation is for some? Yes, I will. And then I'm going to also suggest that there's, it's late. We're going to be discussing it in more detail later. But basically, bifurcating the joint tenancy means that we are going to be splitting the tenancy so that if you, the survivor and the abuser are both on the lease together as joint tenants, so it's Nadja Rosen and Amy Schwartz, if I am the abusive partner, Amy can remove me from the lease potentially and bifurcate the tenancy. Thank you. So next slide, please. So um, this is Amy. Um, is there one of the other important provisions in the law was that it doesn't prohibit localities from retaining or promulgating local laws or ordinances that um, provide enhanced protections um, for uh, domestic violence survivors and their families. Um, some of you may be aware or may not be aware um, that there are a handful, I guess two probably doesn't equal a handful, but at least two um, jurisdictions in New York State that already um, in the absence of statewide uh, protections have passed their own local protections. Those include Monroe and Westchester counties. Um, and there may be there may be other jurisdictions that we don't know about, but these are um, much larger. And um, the law wanted to really make it clear that if 
jurisdictions want to continue to provide specific protections to these families, they absolutely may do so despite um, the state law being in effect. Um, and the other piece is they want to make sure that if there are local laws that are already in effect, that um, if they are more um, if they provide additional or enhanced protections, that um, the passage of the state law doesn't moot those laws. So basically, you can keep your existing laws if they're more protective or pass new ones. And I'm not just, is that you? Is it, yeah, you? this is back to me. Yes, yes. So, Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, so, I, it's important to remember that it, in fact, may be totally reasonable grounds for landlords to deny housing or to discriminate against the survivor based on issues that are that are tangential or directly or indirectly related to their history, but are not enumerated family offenses or violent family offenses, fel violent, violent family of felony offenses. So that includes a criminal background check. So if a landlord requires a criminal background check, and we know that many DV survivors are actually subject, frequently subject to arrest, that there may be a misidentification um, by police when they respond to a call, or both, um, both victim and abuser may be arrested, um, that that then will create a criminal background that may in fact ping them when a landlord is searching for them as a new tenant and may in fact be the reason why they are denied, which is unfortunately totally allowable. Another thing is the poor credit screening. So economic abuse by an abusive partner can lead to significantly bad credit um, on the part of the survivor, which then as well can be another reasonable ground, unfortunately, for a landlord to deny housing. Um, prior, prior rental histories including evictions due to the domestic violence history. References can be very legitimate in the eyes of the law, reasons for why people who are survivors are going to be turned down by any potential new landlords. And adverse actions that are based on the conduct of the tenant's guests. And so these are things to really consider and think about when we're talking about this law and what it can and cannot address. And how really working with survivors who are having housing issues and have housing court cases can be quite complicated. And I think maybe this law somehow doesn't meet all of their needs, especially when the, this is stuff that is not, um, does not fall under the gamut of the enumerated family offenses or the violent felony offenses. Next slide. Okay. So um, what I'll do is I'd like to just stop here really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. I will invite um, the listeners. If you have any questions um, regarding part one of this presentation, um, I would invite you to use the chat feature right now to type in your question. We will be addressing questions at the end of the program, but you don't want to forget um, what question that you may have. The other thing um, that I want to do is um, for those of you that are looking for CLE, um, today's presentation is is CLE, and so I will now be giving the CLE code that we'll be using. Um, you'll need to put in your attorney affirmation. So the CLE code is hello spring with an exclamation point at the end. So again, the CLE code is hello spring. And if you're um, looking for CLE, please make sure to note that and put that in the attorney affirmation. Um, okay, I'm going to turn it over to my co-presenters. Okay. Thanks, Nadja. Are you? Yes. You... Thanks. So, the next, the next uh, area is we're talking about RPAPL 744 and the anti-eviction prevention protections that are now codified there. So. RPAPL 744 says that a tenant shall not be evicted because of their domestic violence status. And that status is what we already previously defined in the RPL. So a defense to an eviction proceeding shall be that the landlord is attempting to recover possession of the property due to the tenant's status as a domestic violence survivor. 
that defense can be rebutted by a landlord showing by showing that they are seeking an eviction for any other lawful reason. And so I think just like what we were, I was talking about earlier about the reasons why the collateral DV history concerns that impact access to housing are continued here as well, that if there is another re lawful reason why the, uh, the landlord is seeking eviction, then that defense can be rebutted. Next. And this is back to Margaret, I think. Sorry, Sorry we had it on mute. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is really talking a little bit about the housing provider and uh, their protection. The law is not intended to restrict a landlord's legal right to evict on the grounds not based or derived on DV victim status. Um, and as we saw in the previous statute, um, RPA PL 744 has a provision the housing providers are not civilly liable to other tenants or their guests uh, arising from a reasonable and a good faith effort to comply with the law. And like the um, real property law, uh, this uh, RPA PL 744, the law does not apply to owner-occupied dwellings that have two or fewer residential units. Um, and this is Amy. I just want to... Um, Given the fact that both the anti-eviction and the anti-discrimination piece um, talks about um, the law not being intended to restrict the landlord's rights um, where the grounds are not based on or derived from DV victim status, just flip that around a little bit. Um, the slide that uh, Nadia covered um, regarding some of the DV history and some of the collateral issues associated with that. Uh, you know, it may be worth trying to argue that the DV history is directly related um, if the landlord is making a decision based on things like um, criminal background check or um, credit history. I mean, the, the client in essence isn't necessarily going to be any worse off, but you want to make sure that you use it responsibly because you don't want to be in the situation of bringing a frivolous claim. But it might be worth when you're talking with the landlord um, and trying to, um, you know, uh, perhaps before you file any kind of a suit um, in negotiations, you know, explain to the landlord that um, all of this DV history may be relevant to explain what might look like, um, you know, a poor rental history or poor credit um, or um, a criminal background check. Uh, do, the, do the other presenters think that that may be worth also addressing with them? I definitely think it'll be, it would be essential because otherwise I I think that it would be far too easy for the landlord to just say, here are my one or two reasons why I didn't take them, and it would just really be, it would, that would just be way too easy. You really would have to get into his discussion of the history, of the history of what, and pinging each of those reasons from the landlord. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing that, I mean, uh, that comes to mind is, and this is a little, not quite directly related, but I know that a number of housing um, attorneys meet tenants on the spot in housing court, and um, it's actually pretty challenging because you meet them for the first time, they've got court papers, uh, they've got holdovers for conduct, but you really need, we need to remember to really screen for DV. It's really a response, it's, it's, it's critical. Um, and the frustrating thing I think we see about what we've been looking at, though, is um, for example, I had a case in court which was a non-payment and the tenant had not been able to pay rent for four months. And <clears throat> normally we can work out deals if DHS pays, uh, can we stay the warrant and see if she can get emergency rent money. But in this case, the landlord came back to me and said, well, we don't want to rent to her because her boyfriend busted out the windows. So we don't want to stay the eviction so she can get emergency rent. And, you know, obviously the statute would not have protected her. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's something, but it's not everything. Um, and, uh, but certainly we have to remember about screening uh, clients um, when we're talking with them, either in your office or in court. 
And I think going off of uh, Margaret's uh, discussion of her client, you know, in we at Downstate, we could maybe get some time, but I think you have to talk to your client about being willing to disclose their status. And that is something that a client may not want to do in housing court. And they may say they don't, they would rather move than have to deal with the fact that then the landlord knows more about their living situation than they ever wanted them to know in the, in the past. And it's a significant burden to place on a survivor to say, okay, well, I'm going to raise this and tell the landlord, like, I do believe this is just pretext and we should get some more time to be, to make you whole. And the only reason you're not allowing me to is because of the actions of my abuser. But then you have to lay all of that bare, and that may be more than the survivor is willing to do. Thanks. Okay. Well, the the last part of the um, statute uh, does discuss that it authorizes a task act of how can affect housing access, um, and it. it discusses how there, well, the study would include reviewing the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program and recommending changes to increase the participation of landlords uh, in that program and improving the overall access to quality and affordable housing. And the members of this task force were supposed to be selected by the governor and speakers of the Senate and the Assembly and provide a report to the governor by January 15th of 2016. Um, just given that the law just passed on January 19th, obviously this couldn't have happened. Um, we did try to find out the status of the task force. For example, had anything moved on it? Uh, we haven't been able to get information yet about um, whether you know anyone's been selected to be on the task force. So right now we're not clear on that status. Okay. So we're doing great on time. Um, again, I'll just remind um, the uh, uh, listeners to use the chat feature to ask any questions that you may have um, around both the um, housing discrimination and the anti-eviction proceedings. But I'm going to move quickly into um, the challenge of this law and um, the issue of local nuisance ordinances. Um, so for uh, some folks may be aware of what nuisance ordinances are, some may not. So I'm going to give a really quick background so that we can all be on the same page um, before we explain a little bit about why um, they may be intersecting with and, and perhaps um, undermining some of the good things that these new laws are intending to do. So um, a nuisance ordinance, um, it's an it's an ordinance because they're generally local laws um, that are passed by um, a town or a village or a hamlet or a city. Um, and they generally uh, declare a property a nuisance um, when there's certain kinds of conduct that occurs at the property that um, that jurisdiction considers um, nuisance oriented. Um, generally, in nuisance ordinances, the property um, or the uh, the the law requires that a nuisance be abated. Um, now, in some cases, when the nuisance is a tenant, um, an abatement generally means um, that you have to remove the tenant. Um, it may mean um, a discontinuance of whatever condition may be happening at the property. Sometimes you see nuisance ordinances for like unmowed lawns or um, noise, things of that nature. Um, but for the purposes of the, what we're talking about um, with the conduct base um, issues, um, it usually requires um, the nuisance being abated or the landlord facing some sort of an action um, from the jurisdiction um, where the nuisance is allowed to continue. Um, so uh, the way that these seem to be playing out in New York State, we don't know how many there are um, because there are so many um, jurisdictions in New York State between the towns, the villages, um, the cities, and the hamlets. Um, there are so many um, areas that have their own local codes and local ordinances, and there's really not um, any kind of a database that contains um, these and codes them so that they're searchable in any way. Um, you generally have to look 
town by town, community by community to see what their local nuisance ordinances say. But um, for the, these, these appear to be um, gaining in, popu in popularity where um, if there are certain numbers of calls for generally police service to a particular residence, or if there are certain types of conduct that occurs at the residence or certain kinds of criminal convictions that occur at the residence, that would trigger a violation of the local nuisance ordinance. When you look at many of these ordinances, the triggering nuisances, the triggering nuisance violations often include the enumerated family offenses that Nadja discussed in the beginning of the program um, today. And so as you can imagine, domestic violence survivors get swept up in these nuisance, um, viola these nuisance code violations with great frequency. And in fact, um, what the studies um, nationally, as well as in New York State in particular, indicate is that these nuisance ordinances are disproportionately impact victims of domestic violence and their families, um, both in New York State and other parts of the country. They also disproportionately impact poor folks as well as people of color, but for the purposes today, they disproportionately impact um, these particular families. Who calls the police with great frequency? Um, it's, it's victims of domestic violence who need the support and protection um, of um, all the uh, police and emergency services, and frankly, um, when a victim of domestic violence gets an order of protection or when they speak with a domestic violence program or when they speak with their attorney, um, all the messaging that we give them is call the police for help. But in these communities, when they call the police for help, it may trigger a nuisance ordinance. Um, so as you can imagine, now we have these anti of the nation protections um, in place, um, and you, you put that against a nuisance ordinance that says if certain kinds of conduct occurs at the property, it will trigger a nuisance violation. Or if certain numbers of calls for police assistance um, occur, um, that will trigger a nuisance ordinance. Um, and now landlords are going to be put in a really challenging position. Um, they're going to be told by the local, by the locality, if you don't abate the nuisance, we're going to pull out the parade of things that we can do um, at that property, and that may include fines. It could include um, uh, uh, a loss of their property. Um, in the most extreme cases, the um, the city or town can actually take the, do a taking. Um, but the other thing that it can do is it can include fines. So you have the locality saying, you know, if you don't abate the nuisance, you're going to get fined every day and you're going to lose your ability to rent the unit. Um, and so the landlords then have to make a choice. Um, if I'm going to follow the state law and, uh, and um, not get rid of that family, even though it triggered a nuisance ordinance, that may mean that I have to then plead my case with a local um, town um, and, because now I'm in violation of the nuisance ordinance. And it may result in that landlord losing their rental permit, so um, the victim uh, and the children may be out anyway. Um, regardless of the fact that there are anti-discrimination protections because the landlord can't legally rent that unit. Um, it's highly problematic uh, when you have one um, local law that says one thing and you have a state law that may say another and that's going to put that um, landlord in a really challenging position. Remember, the uh, anti-discrimination and the anti-eviction protections apply to landlords, not to municipalities. Um, there is a bill um, pending in um, New York State that would try to rectify this issue, not just for um, domestic violence survivors, but to any crime victims who call the police for help. Um, but until that time right now, we have a proliferation of nuisance ordinances that are really going to be, um, I think, potentially undermining um, the protection. Nobody um, steps forward or until landlord steps forward and decides whether they're going to um, 
endure uh, an action by a victim in state court or if they're going to do an endure an action um, by the municipality that gives them the ability to rent their properties. Um, I would say, practically speaking, most landlords are probably going to take their chances on the family and hope that the family doesn't know what their laws and rights are because nobody's tracking them, very few people may be supporting them and the survivors may not be aware that they even have access to these housing protections. Whereas the municipalities may be really right on top of sending out code violation letters um, when there is a violation. Often um, the police reach out directly to landlords right after there may be an incident that um, tags that nuisance ordinance and, tell, and begin to send um, letters to the landlords indicating that um, they're in danger of losing their rental property um, or their license or their ability to rent the property or whatever, you know, whatever the um, um, third party policing um, provisions are that are in the ordinance um, that will uh, trigger, um, uh, that, will, that will put the landlord um, in a bad position. If you want to learn more about the issue of nuisance ordinances, and there's more and more coming out every day, um, Empire Justice Center's been um, putting together a resource page for the last few years. We put um, scholarly articles, cases, et cetera, um, up on this so um, folks can be aware of um, the direction that the law is heading. Um, okay. All right. I'm just going to advance the slide. Okay. So there's additional housing-related statutes that we wanted to take the opportunity to let um, uh, all of you know about. Um, in addition to this, um, if you don't already know about it, to remind you of what. Okay. So I'm going to turn it over here to my co-presenters. Um, so we've listed here um, the VAWA statute, the Violence Against Women Act of 2013, um, which uh, covers many federally subsidized housing providers, including low-income tax credit projects. Um, and VAWA um, certainly is a much better statute to consider if, if we had to change the current ones we're discussing, because it, it certainly affords a lot more protection to um, to persons who've been affected by domestic survivors of domestic violence. Uh, and just briefly, um, it prevents tenants from being evicted or being denied due to their DV status. It allows the housing provider to bifurcate the lease and evict the abuser. And it can allow the survivor to become a leaseholder, even if they're not originally the head of their household. And it allows for emergency transfers within the, um, the same complex or um, same landlord. In your really clear individual public housing agencies or authorities to figure out what their processes are for lease bifurcation in particular, because it, they, it, change, it changes depending on, at least downstate, who is actually administering the plan, whether it's Section 8 from, there's three or four different agencies downstate that, that are dealing with Section 8, and also New York City Housing Authority has a separate plan as well for how they bifurcate leases. And so it's important to sort of find out what the different ins and outs are of that process. Okay. And then we've just listed some of the local anti-discrimination protections that Amy was mentioning, um, Monroe County and Westchester County. And there are the citations there for you. If you live in those counties, you can take a look. Or if you want to advocate for um, protections in those counties, um, you absolutely can um, look at what some of the other communities have done. And then the, the other one we have uh, list here is Real Property Law 227C, which allows for an early lease termination. Um, it allows the DV survivor who has an order of protection um, to petition the court, which issued the order. Uh, to be released from the lease early without a financial penalty. Um, but there are a lot of different pieces of that law. It's not a, uh, e necessarily easy, um, and it's not a quick fix. Um, but it does allow um, a, a, certainly a survivor to try to uh, get out of a lease early. Nadia, do you want to just mention New York City Administrative Code? Yes. So 
the New York City Administrative Code also allows domestic violence survivors to maintain their rental unit as their primary residence, even if they left the unit because of the violence. So if they went to go to shelter, um, but they are intending to return, the landlord may not commence proceedings to recover possession of the, of the property in like a non-primary residence case, potentially, if it's a rent stabilized or rent control department, unless the landlord first gives 30 days notice to the tenant. So the tenant must be a survivor of domestic violence as defined by the social services law and also must state an intent to return to live in the unit. So this is great if, in fact, the survivor has left and feels safe returning to that apartment. Um, but whether or not they do is would be a question that you would have to really explore. You know, if you've left the, your apartment to go into a domestic violence shelter, one wonders if you would then feel safe returning to that to the address where your abuser knew where you lived. But maybe circumstances are such that you, in fact, would feel safe and then would be able to return, and then you would be can stave off a non-primary residence holdover from your landlord who's looking to recover your apartment. Great. Thank you. All right, so that is the end of the program um, for the substantive um, piece. We have um, some time for questions, and I see we do have one question in the question box, um, so I'll direct this to our presenters. Can you please just clarify whether the abuser needs to be convicted of um, those enumerated crimes? So whether um, the violent felony offenses or the family offenses need to actually have a conviction in order for somebody to be considered um, as having um, victim of domestic violence status. So this is a fact. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So no, they do not. In fact, you don't even have to have an order of protection. You just need to be a person for whom this has occurred. So as long as you are willing, I guess at some point, if if question to describe how you fit into this status as DV victim, then you can do these protections. You do not have to have a conviction. You do not even need to have an order of protection. It's pretty, that is, I think, an incredible, um, that's really an incredible piece of this law, that you do not have to have this you know, final order of protection piece of paper to be able to in invoke the protections of the law. And, and in contrast, um, you know, we have the early lease termination, which at the time that that was written, um, gosh, probably going on about eight years ago, um, that law does require somebody to have an order of protection in order to be eligible to access that law. So just to be mindful that there are multiple definitions um, and jurisdictions, um, jurisdictional questions with all of these housing issues that unfortunately we don't have one streamlined definition and then somebody can pick um, what relief they need. Um, it's the, every definition is just a little bit different. Because I guess that's now how New York's doing it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, again, I'll just remind folks to use the chat feature to ask any questions that you have. Um, and you can send the um, the panel lay, or you can send it to the full audience. We'll be entertaining them. I'm going to check the question box and see if there's any other questions that came in. I uh, have another, we have a couple of questions here. Okay. Um, what's the eligibility criteria for protection under the VAWA statute? Those all definitions, um, they're contained in federal law. Um, the definition of victim of domestic violence um, is contained there, and I believe that the VAWA protections, um, some dating violence and stalking um, as well, um, but I'll defer to my co-presenters if they know more about VAWA. Nope. No. Okay. Beyond, yeah. uh, so, Not so beyond that. Definitions um, are also different under the VAWA statute. So if you wanted to seek out um, any VAWA specific remedies um, with uh, federally subsidized um, or supported housing, um, you'd want to look to the federal law. There are tremendous numbers of, of um, resources for VAWA protections that somebody could um, look at independent of this training here today um, in order to um, access those that relief for your clients. 
Okay, the next question is, um, what if the victim flees the residence, both parties are on the lease, and the other party fails to pay the rent? Can the other party be held liable? Hmm. I, I, I guess the question is, if the, if, so the, just to be clear, both the abuser and the survivor are on the lease, survivor flees, abuser fails to pay the rent, who is responsible for the, to, for the payment of the rent? I, I, do we agree that's what? Question, yeah. Would, would somebody, I guess basically what, I'll reread the question. What if the victim flees the residence, both parties are on the lease, and the other party fails to pay the rent? Can the other party be held liable? Well, I think both will be held liable. That's, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so then, we, go, Margaret, sorry. No, no, I agree. It sounds like both could be liable. Because both are tenants of the apartment. So both have an obligation to pay the rent. Unless there's a, a you know, a lease bifurcation, um, until you're absolved of your um, responsibilities, you're held liable. That may not necessarily be discrimination or protect somebody from um, eviction. Um, I would imagine that may be a reasonable basis upon which a landlord could evict somebody for non-payment, um, even though the non-payment may be related to somebody's status as a victim of domestic violence, it may not necessarily protect them from anti-eviction. There would be a cognizable claim um, that the landlord would have that they're entitled to payment. And there isn't a lease bifurcation provision in the anti-eviction piece um, or in the anti-discrimination piece, meaning that the um, court cannot split the lease and unless um, the victim has an order of protection and they want to um, bifurcate the lease under that provision, um, the courts pr probably can't do much other than, you know, um, maybe, I don't know if that would mitigate the damages or anything, but... Um, right, I mean, one might wonder, you know, if you go, as a survivor, if you go to your landlord and say, I just fled, I'd like to be let out of the lease, no process of the lease bifurcation, if you get sued for those months in between when you ask the question, you ask to be let out and you your lease was actually bifurcated and you no longer had an obligation to pay, maybe you could use the defense if a non-payment was brought against you that you were being discriminated against based on your DV status. I don't know, we could try it. Yeah. And, and remember, this, this is a new law. I mean, we don't really have anything. You know, this is all, we're going through the law section by section, piece by piece, because, um, you know, we're wanna, we want to let folks know, you know, what the law says. We're going to need, probably need to get creative using it and, and just see how it goes as we begin to really try to use it and enforce it. Okay, we got one more question. Regarding real property law 227C, does the order of protection have to be a final order of protection, or does a temporary order of protection satisfy the requirements to be released from a lease early? Order. That around the two, we have done some of those in our office in Brooklyn, and there's a lot of, um, education to be done in the courts around the fact that this even exists or the filing of some request in criminal court to um, ask for this kind of relief, which is not to say you shouldn't do it, just be prepared to spend some time hanging out with the clerk's office trying to figure out how to make, to actually put this in front of a judge. Well, thank you. All right, any other questions? We um, just want to make sure we've covered everything. I think that's all. Okay, we've got um, just a couple minutes. If you have a burning question, please ask it now. <laughs> All right, so seeing no additional questions um, coming through, um, um, miraculously, um, we're finished a little bit early um, for today's program. Um, please take the time to review the law. Um, we've included as one of the handouts a copy of the bill itself. Um, so you can not only take a look at the um, 
the language that, of the new law, but you can also see the legislative intent um, on who the various sponsors were. Um, it's a law that actually um, got a fair amount of um, bipartisan support um, as sponsors and um, was one that was um, really um, people were really hopeful that this law would finally pass. So um, please use the law. Keep Empire Justice Center as well as your um, domestic violence and housing colleagues apprised of when you use the law. We're definitely um, really interested in seeing how it gets implemented. And um, you know, hopefully um, your offices could also get, get some nice attorney's fees um, if you are successful. So um, please keep us posted. Um, and with that, I'll just remind folks that um, to the um, CLE code was hello spring. Um, please complete your attorney affirmation. And um, for those of you that are new attorneys, uh, the law did change this year. The um, I think the the um, regulations did change this year, so you actually can get credit, I believe, um, if you're a new attorney um, for um, remote programming, which is terrific. So hopefully um, we can have everybody on today's call who need CLE credit to get CLE credit. Um, thank you to Margaret and to Nadja. Um, and um, everybody, have a great week. And thank you to you, Amy, as well, for putting this together. Thank you. Thank you all. all right. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.